All right, so why don't we jump right into our first and most important topic of the day, the Intel XEDG1. So oh, really? Okay. <clears throat> EEC filings have leaked information about Intel's new dedicated graphics card. So for those of you who are sort of just getting up to speed with this, Intel has actually been a major supplier of computer graphics hardware for many, many, many years. It's just that it hasn't really been computer graphics hardware that is uh, that anyone especially wants to use. Now, way back in the day, Intel's onboard graphics were terrible in basically every meaningful way. I mean, you remember computers with onboard graphics? Yeah. They're bad, right? Yeah. Okay, but the thing is, they were bad for reasons that they aren't really bad for anymore. So. Back in the old days, when your, in, when your integrated graphics was uh, on your north bridge, was where you'd usually find it, so that was on your chipset separate from uh, your CPU, uh, it would actually suck up some of your system memory. Oh, I mean, Intel integrated graphics still usually does that now. Um, anyway, that's not the point, that's not the point. So it would suck up your system memory, oftentimes a significant chunk of it, and back when system memory was really expensive, it was slow, and in some cases, it was not very efficient. So that Northbridge would end up with like a noisy fan on it. Um, so there were other solutions. Uh, NVIDIA, back in the Enforce chipset days, used to ship integrated graphics versions of their chipsets. And these didn't necessarily solve the efficiency problem, but they solved one of the other big problems. And that's that integrated graphics used to have horrible compatibility for games, let alone enough performance to run them. Sorry, oh. what is that sound? That's the heater up there. Oh, but, did someone crank it? Uh, no, I think it's still on a schedule, okay, so cool. it's automatic. <clears throat> anyway. And you say it was bad for games, but I could play Dangerous Dave back then. I can't do that anymore. Yeah, but that's different, okay? <laughs> that's like DOS compatible. That's, that's Windows switching from like using a, a DOS kernel to the NT kernel. I that's don't know not what like. Said. Okay, anyway. All I know is I can't play my game anymore. Okay, you actually can play that game. I believe that game is on good old games. Oh, if you go to GOG.com, okay. <laughs> I bet you can find Dangerous Dave. So you go, you go on you, that you fetch quest that right while I run Sorry, people what? through GOG? what was wrong with integrated graphics. GOG.com. Um, okay, so yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. I don't know what I'm going to say about it. Our, our Apple Pro Display XDR is here. So anyway, the main problem was not necessarily even the performance. It was just outright compatibility. So either it would lack the features, you know, like hardware transform and lighting or whatever else, or the, or the most up-to-date DirectX feature set, or it would just have such broken, terrible drivers that even if the game should run, it wouldn't. It would just, it would just crash all the time. And so Intel, over the last 10 years or so, has come a long way. So their onboard graphics are now so power efficient that they can bake them right onto the CPU themselves and still hit sub 100 watt TDPs. Their drivers and feature set are now basically up to date. I think there's still a lot of work they could do in terms of uh, you know, catching up to what AMD and NVIDIA are doing with respect to things like sharpening filters and all these like cool features that you can enable in your games, like a 3D you know, screenshots and all that kind of cool stuff. They're a long way away from that. But in terms of just basically functioning in games, they are worlds ahead of where they used to be. So if you've got good efficiency and you've got, you know, um, decent compatibility and you've got the feature set sort of down, then why not scale it up? Now, unfortunately, it's not really that simple. And, oh man, what do they call it? Gen, I think is what they call their, their onboard graphics that are built into their CPUs. These little, little tiny, tiny graphics chips um, was never really designed to go ultra wide. Not, not like the monitors, but uh, it was never designed to be like a, a wider design. Um, so they've had to re-architect this basically from scratch, as far as we can tell. So DG1 is supposed to be a proper, dedicated graphics card. And initially, my understanding is Intel wasn't making a ton of noise about it from like a consumer or gaming perspective, but then they ran out and they hired a bunch of, you know, 
gaming and enthusiast community people to handle the messaging around this. They grabbed Chris Hook from AMD. They grabbed Kyle Bennett. Actually, I don't know if Kyle Bennett was on the GPU team specifically. Anyway, he's not there anymore. Um, so they grabbed Chris Hook. I'm trying to think of who else they grabbed. Um, but they, there was this like big push towards better messaging and a better relationship with the enthusiast community. And so that's got people thinking, okay, maybe, maybe it is gonna be like a gaming graphics card. All right, so here's the latest information that we've got. Um, the specs include 96 execution units, which incidentally um, seems to be uh, the same as what they're planning to use in their next generation 10 nanometer Tiger Lake CPUs. So that would put its performance on par with onboard graphics. And then there's three SKUs listed. DG1 external FRD1 accessory kit, Discrete Graphics DG1 8 plus 2, and Discrete Graphics DG1 6 plus 2. Um, the latter could be designation for designations for gigabytes of RAM, but that's not really clear. So wait, can I ask? <coughs> yes. So they just made an, a new integrated graphics card. Right, so what, we, what it looks like right now is that they're gonna ship what would be integrated graphics but on a discrete card with its own frame buffer built onto it. There's is some- Is it supposed to be really cheap or something? Well, we don't know. Okay. There is some speculation that Intel is working on drivers for like multi-GPU performance scaling. And so then there's some speculation that maybe this could be intended as kind of like, like, a, like a nitrous boost card for your system that only has integrated graphics and the two of them will like work together or something. How many systems actually have only integrated graphics now? Or how many people actually use only integrated graphics now? Well, lots of people do, but mostly at the low end of the market. So the thing about dedicated graphics is it tends not to really make a ton of sense below about the $100, $120 price point because there's so much cost overhead in building a card Getting an HDMI license, like it's like two dollars per connector or something like that. Like that's nothing in the context of a thousand dollar graphics card, but it's a big deal when you're trying to hit ninety nine ninety nine. Um, you know, you got to build a, you got to put a cooler on it. That's another, you know, seven dollars or whatever. Like there's, there's all these things that are kind of fixed costs, uh, packaging, shipping and logistics, just time on the SMT line as they're, as they're producing the damn thing, because it takes up exactly as much space as something that you could sell for 200 or 300 or $500. So there's all this there's overhead, uh, even if some of it is just in the form of opportunity costs. You still have to QC it the same. You can't just ship a dead one, so you still have to you know, put it in the, in the hot box and you know, run it for 24 hours or whatever, make sure it works. I, I don't know, or maybe you don't, whatever. Um, but the, the point is there's a lot of overhead why, that why you're- Why are they all saying F? Wait, anyway, sorry, so there's all this story. overhead okay. involved in building a graphics card. So low yeah. end discrete cards tend not to make any sense. Now, AMD had this idea back in the Radeon like 4,000, 3,000 days. So this is like, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, whenever it was that one of the ways that you could make low-end cards make more sense was if they worked together with the onboard graphics that are built into your APU, as AMD calls them, which is a CPU with built-in graphics, um, running in Crossfire, then, then at least you're not throwing away one or the other. You're getting the combined performance of both of them and you could, you could make that kind of make sense. Now, as soon as you get into higher-end cards, the overhead of trying to communicate with those yeah. onboard graphics cores um, basically means that any positive contribution is pretty much wasted, but, but at the very low end, maybe it could make sense. So that's where some of the speculation is coming from. I believe it was like someone found some Linux code that seemed to suggest that Intel was working on multi-GPU. The specs for this thing, 768 shader units, 96 execution units, seem to suggest that it's going to be similarly, similarly specced to their upcoming integrated graphics. Um, for my part, I don't know, I don't know if I buy it um, because the amount of frame buffer here doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Like there's no way that you'd need eight gigs of VRAM for something that's competitive with like an RX 570 or 1050T. I mean, I guess, actually, I guess you can get, you can get RX 570s with eight gigs of VRAM, can't you? So if the Tiger Lake graphics core is, similar to Ice Lake Iris Plus, 
Um, that would put performance of DG1 at roughly a 1.5x improvement over the 64 execution unit, Iris Plus now putting it in 1050 Ti and RX 570 territory. I mean, it's not the threat to NVIDIA and AMD that, or especially NVIDIA, that everyone out there has been hoping for, but um, I mean, I guess it's a start. The thing to me that's really baffling about all of this is that Intel has been sharing such like, like riced out, like juiced up looking imagery of this card. Like, let me see if I can find it. Sure. Uh, Intel DG1 render. Um, let's have a look. Intel set sights on whatever. Intel discrete GPU struggles. Yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to find out which ones are the ones that Intel has actually shared. This might just be a cool render from someone. I don't know. Maybe, and maybe I've fallen for it. Guys, if anyone has a link to any renders that Intel has actually directly shared for their upcoming graphics card product, okay, that so, would be good. So, to know. in what world would you consider this a good thing then that Intel has made this thing? If is it just if the price is really good and it works in combination, like in addition to whatever you already have? Oh no, I mean it's undoubtedly a good thing. Um, Okay, so then people are just upset because it's not as good as they thought? Okay, so it's a good thing, but only for a certain customer. So if you're someone who plays nothing but Dota, League of Legends, Rocket League, and you want to upgrade an older system, and you want, and I mean, for all of Intel's faults, the products are reliable for the most part. They make mistakes. I mean, I think the... Uh, the, the speculative execution issues, you know, your meltdown, your specter, all that kind of stuff, uh, they, they, they definitely make mistakes. But when it comes to hardware engineering, if nothing else, they build a reliable product, whether it's an SSD or a CPU or whatever the case may be. Um, so you've got this reliable brand name, um, I mean, something that graphics card makers, especially the, the low end ones are notorious for is terrible warranty support. So they've got the they've got the the support infrastructure set up around the world. So they're this this trusted company that could bring this entry level graphics card to market for people who have an older system that they're just looking to add just enough capability to in order to play esports titles online with their friends. Okay. Um, and if you're in a market like uh, Brazil where you have literally hundreds of percent tariffs on anything that you buy, you know every ten dollars cheaper for something that's in the same uh, performance tier as like a $150 card, that makes a big difference to the affordability to you, especially if your income isn't very high. So having more options, always fantastic for the market. But I think that the enthusiast community, especially with some of the hires that Intel was making around the time that the graphics unit seemed to be spinning up and Roger Kaduri moved over from AMD um, and all this stuff was happening, um, the enthusiast community, I think, got the idea that we were going to be looking at something very, very high performance. And this speculation was fueled by rumors that Intel was really targeting the data center space, where they wanted to go up against things like AMD's Radeon Instinct and uh, NVIDIA's Tesla cards in like supercomputing applications. Now, that may still be possible. And that may actually be why we're seeing uh, this Linux code around multi-GPU. Maybe it's not about you know Intel Crossfire or SLI or whatever you want to call it. Maybe it's not about putting this discrete card into an entry-level system and getting a performance boost. Or maybe they'll do that too because they're already working on it anyway. Maybe what's more likely is that we're going to see like some honking giant card that's got like 16 of these things on it. That's all powered by like a couple of eight pin PCIe connectors. Because remember guys, that's what Intel does well. Extraordinarily efficient GPUs that you can pack right onto a CPU. With that said, AMD also does that very well and actually in many cases better. But <clears throat> the point is we're talking about, we're speculating about what Intel might be doing here, not AMD. So maybe what we're looking at then is we're looking at many of these operating on a single card, many of which you could slot into a server, and maybe cumulatively, it has a lot of performance, but that ultimately probably won't be that meaningful for enthusiasts. So I think this is just a matter of enthusiasts seeing like fan renders like this, which 
as far as we can tell, is not real at all. This is just concept art done by, uh, let's see, <coughs> a student from Brazil. So people are looking at stuff like this going, okay, you know, finally someone to, you know, give NVIDIA some humility, um, but, but no, it looks I like- I thought that's been AMD recently. Mm, to okay. Intel, yeah. yes. Okay. To NVIDIA, not so much. Uh, NVIDIA is running a process node behind them and still competitive, if not better, at almost every price point. Because NVIDIA really over the last, I mean, five to, not 10, uh, I'd say ever since CUDA. So yeah, almost over the last 10 years, NVIDIA has really tried to differentiate uh, on software. Because NVIDIA launched some, and I guess it's been probably, you could say, accelerated ever since their dud of a 400 series. So they've launched some bad hardware products. But NVIDIA's whole argument over the last, you know, really especially five to seven years has been, right, so there's the performance. We can talk about FPS per dollar until we're blue in the face, but that just becomes like a, who can slash their price the best? Who can get their costs the lowest? Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a fool's game, is, is their attitude about it. So they've really been focused on trying to build software that differentiates their products such that if they're 10% slower at the same price point or if they cost 15% more, they're like, okay. Well, if you want GeForce Experience, let's say, which does have redeeming features, or if you want, um, you know, our awesome um, built-in encoder, or if you want this great, you know, screenshotting, you know, feature that's built into some games or whatever the case may be, then you're just gonna have to run NVIDIA. Um, things like in-home streaming, they were one of the pioneers in that space. I mean, now anyone can do it, NVIDIA or AMD. Uh, G-Sync's another example, which now you can run on AMD or NVIDIA. It's not quite the same solution. So, so that's kind of their whole thing is like, look, we built it a little better, so we're just gonna charge more. And AMD has competitive products, but really only in the several hundred dollar range. As soon as you get up into kind of the $500 or so range, AMD doesn't have anything compelling. As far as we can tell, Radeon 7 was just a way to burn through some GPU inventory that they couldn't move to their data center clients. And then it was forgotten about as soon as it appeared. Um, okay. So yeah, we really, we, and I'm using like, we, I'm speaking for the entire PC enthusiast community. We want a competitor to NVIDIA, a legitimate competitor in the high end. And we were really hoping that if AMD couldn't get their act together, Intel would step in motivated by chasing that business in the data center where you can sell, you know, tens of thousands of GPUs on a single PO. Um, motivated by that, they would come in and they would compete in the gaming space, which is, less lucrative, but certainly a high volume market and something that is worthwhile to participate in. It's just, it might be baby steps. We might be looking at something that's pretty much, you know, for running CSGO at decent frame rates on a budget. And then if we're lucky, it'll scale from there. Okay. Well, I feel like I got a really good history lesson just now. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully the audience was into it. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I feel like I tend to explain things more thoroughly if I can't just take for granted that the person sitting next to me already knows what I'm talking about. So that's, that's interesting. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>